Despite the fact that nearly 100 ceremonies would follow, there was a nonchalance surrounding the first Academy Awards. There was no red carpet or media buzz. It remains the only ceremony that wasn't even broadcast on radio or television. There was no suspense either, with the winners having been announced three months prior. Nobody knew they had just birthed an American institution, and the entire ceremony lasted a mere 15 minutes. The ceremony was an afterthought, a mere formality to disguise Louis B. Mayer's real goal in creating the Academy. Mayer was the co-founder of one of the Golden Age's most prestigious movie studios, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM. More importantly, though, he was an imposing, conniving man, and he desperately wanted to use movie budgets to fund his own private beach house. In order to get the house built by the rapidly approaching summer, he enlisted dozens of underpaid technicians to work 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This blatant disregard for ethics or care for employees was a common practice for Mayer, and he was soon given a heads up by MGM production manager Joe Cohn that the studio members were on the verge of forming a union and going on strike. Mayer couldn't have this. He had a beach house to build. And so he came up with a plan. He would create the Academy, a nebulous organization that brought together the five branches of movie making. And the Academy, among other perks, would hold an annual ceremony awarding those same lowly technicians and writers and stars for their selfless efforts in providing entertainment for the masses. In Mayer's own words, I found that the best way to handle movie makers was to hang medals all over them. If I got them cups and awards, they'd kill themselves to produce what I wanted. That's why the Academy Award was created. Slowly but surely, the Academy would gain this prestigious honor Mayer wanted, and on May 16, 1929, the first annual Academy Awards was held. The event was hosted by adventure film star Douglas Fairbanks, the first president of the Academy and one of only five people who had decided the night's big winner. Despite all of this, there's actually a lot to appreciate about this first ceremony, and more importantly, the films that were nominated. We've got 12 categories to go through, and I've done my due diligence as an honorary central judge and watched every film of the night, or at least the ones that have survived to 2024. And spoiler alert, the films of 1927 and 1928 are really, really good. This was a fascinating time of Hollywood history. Silent films were still produced almost exclusively, but sound was on the horizon with one of our films tonight being the one most commonly considered the first sound picture ever, The Jazz Singer. But don't worry, we're going to examine more than just The Jazz Singer and Best Picture winner Wings. We'll talk about Chang, the only documentary ever nominated for Best Picture, and Speedy, Harold Lloyd's most underrated role, and Cedric Gibbons, the man who designed the Oscar we know and love today. Welcome to 1929. Welcome to the first Academy Awards. May I have the envelope, please? Best Picture was broken up into two separate awards for the first and only time in the Academy's 100-year history. The first was Outstanding Picture, and the second was Best Unique and Artistic Picture. The difference between the two categories is fairly minimal. We've got drama in both, romance in both. Ultimately, the Academy would retroactively decide that Outstanding Picture was its highest honor, and these two categories would be combined going forward. But it's an interesting trivia note for this unprecedented ceremony. Another interesting note is that the jazz singer was disqualified from both categories, as it was considered unfairly advantaged by being a synchronized sound film. In the Academy's own words, the film was sui generis, I hope I pronounced that right, or in a class by itself is its English translation, and thus it was too advanced to compete against the six silent works. Because the difference is unremarkable, let's start with the artistic picture category, as I really enjoyed all three films nominated. Our first nominee is Chang, a sort of faux documentary. Chang follows the lives of Siamese farmers as they struggle to survive in the unrelenting jungle. 
Because it's a documentary, we get some truly beautiful shots of wildlife and how farmers of a completely foreign place and time would have lived. This is a film that is incredibly niche. If you aren't into documentaries or survival films or animals, you more than likely won't like this. But I'm a sucker. I loved Chang. There's a sort of earnestness in the depictions of the Siamese people, and they're shown with so much more reverence than what would typically be expected of a 1928 film. And trust me, we've got some bad depictions of Asian people and even the other films of the night. This is a low bar to clear, though. Luckily, there's a lot more to Chang. As mentioned before, this is technically the only documentary to ever be up for the night's top prize. It's a fact diminished slightly by Chang not fully being a documentary. A few scenes are staged, like a tiger chasing a tribe elder up a tree, or the unusual choice to have a talking monkey in the film. Under the benefits of the silent medium, a few title cards are enough for this documentary to enter the realm of fantasy, with Bimbo the Gibbon's monkey. More than a weird decision, there's a lot of care to Chang's more fantastical elements. They feel like necessary evils to appeal to a wide audience. Another inspired choice here is the title, Chang. Chang is a Thai word, meaning elephant, but that was a surprise twist to audiences at the time. We know that Chang is terrorizing our protagonists, but we don't know what Chang is until we do. One review in Photoplay's June 1927 issue touches on this twist, while also comparing the film favorably to Nanook of the North, the first movie I thought of when watching Chang, and one that came to mind frequently. Like Nanook, Chang is a documentary, realized through staged interactions. Sure, not everything that happens in Chang is true, but it doesn't matter, as it is an invaluable time capsule for a world no longer with us. The Bangkok Post confirms this sad reality, claiming much of what we see in Chang has been replaced with hotels and industries. Because of this, Chang is worth celebrating. It is a ridiculous achievement of filmmaking, with one of the earliest ever uses of handheld cameras. Apparently, one of our two directors shot the camera, while the other lined up a gunshot, in case anything went wrong. Of course, as a product of 1927, there is some unneeded and difficult animal cruelty to stomach, but it's given more of a pass here than in any other works, as its goal is to show the lives of this group of people completely foreign to me, and most definitely foreign to every 1927 American who watched Chang. Although it will lose the award, I think Chang should be recognized as one of the coolest works ever up for the top prize. Again, I say the top prize, though unique and artistic picture is technically the disbanded category, and none of these three films are recognized today as our first best picture. But this category was certainly taken very seriously at the first awards. In fact, it was probably the closest race of any we will discuss tonight. The two remaining films in the running were Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, and The Crowd. The win will ultimately go to Sunrise, making it the only winner this defunct category would ever see. But the board of directors actually wanted the crowd to win the top prize. In Carla Valderrama's This Was Hollywood, she explains that in the early morning hours of February 16th, director King Vidor was told that the judges had planned to give Vidor's film The Crowd the Unique and Artistic Picture Award, but that Mayer had spent the night fighting their decision. Even though MGM, Mayer's company, had produced the film, Mayer argued that the crowd, about an average man who worked hard and didn't get anywhere, wouldn't promote the Academy's lofty goal of encouraging the improvement and advancement of the arts and sciences in the profession. Mayer believed Sunrise, directed by the world-renowned German expressionist director F.W. Murnau, was a better choice. It also had the added benefit of being produced by Fox Studios, which gave Mayer cover against accusations of rigging the vote. At 5 a.m., the exhausted board finally gave in. There's certainly a lot to unpack there. Of course, Vidor was biased. His own film lost the award. But if this is true, and it certainly seems to be given the Academy's original basis for creation, then we have here likely the most blatant form of rigging in all 100 years of ceremonies. We've seen numbers fudge and banquets sway minds, but a film flat out winning the award and one person puts their foot down and says no? That's unprecedented. But The Crowd is far from an optimistic film. To be honest, it might be my favorite film the entire ceremony, maybe second. The Crowd follows John, a man who has his entire life ahead of him. 
He heads to the big city, desperate to make a name for himself. But he finds that he is just one small, small cog in an astronomically large machine. It's unflinching, with no true happy ending and no rags-to-riches success story that we will see probably 1,000 more times in the following century. In a way, it's almost the antithesis of what Hollywood represents. The crowd is a cautionary tale. The big city is nothing more than a mirage, and any success it promises is more than likely not going to come to you. It's tough to say with certainty, but this may be my single favorite silent film ever made. One recurring thing I noticed with this first ceremony is that silent film had practically been perfected by this point. Instead of a crutch that movies had to lean on, the limitations of silence were used creatively to help tell universal stories. For one, the art of the title card was unmatched in 1928. When you think of title cards, you might think of these, long exposition dumps that flash on screen for about five seconds too long. But the best films of the night... The Changs, the crowds, the sunrises, they had mastered the title card. We've got fun font choices, jokes and gags in our silent comedies, and backdrops that set the mood. Sunrise, our winning film, has the added distinction of abandoning title cards as the film progresses. We start with one a minute, slowly decreasing a number until the back half of the film is cardless. We were at a point in 1927 and 1928 where synchronized sound effects had become a new normal for silent films, and it means that we get these beautiful cacophonies of silence and bells ringing and crowds yelling and storms blowing. It's truly incredible stuff, and it's actually really incredible timing that the first Academy Awards also marks the final year where silent films outnumber talkies. As mentioned earlier, the jazz singer is up for an award tonight and it was considered too advanced to compete against the lowly silent films of the world. But, without revealing too much, I can say that that film, and many hundreds of films in the following ceremonies, don't hold a candle to these absolutely brilliant silent works. I consider there to be six Best Picture nominees this year. It's still less than the ten we see today. But if we're playing by the Academy's rules, there were three options for our top prize. Let's start with Seventh Heaven. It's a film we'll mention a few times tonight, as it's up for more categories than any other work. Seventh Heaven follows Chico and Diane. Chico is a sewer rat, cleaning Paris' sewers at night while dreaming to one day become a street sweeper. He meets Diane, saving her from a pretty brutal attack. Diane is a prostitute, and Chico pretends they are husband and wife to avoid Diane's arrest. Diane and Chico fall in love, until ultimately Chico is drafted to fight in the First World War. The best part of Seventh Heaven is its frankly incredible sets. It's got the parasite effect, immense verticality, contrasting people in the sewers with the height of a high-rise apartment, which is closer to the stars, yada yada yada. It's fairly light, but this is a fine movie. It's charming, not quite as good as any other I've discussed so far, but probably the second best film nominated for the top prize. The weakest is The Racket, a crime film that is the only one here that doesn't feel like the peak of the silent film. It's got that stilted title card exposition dump effect, and it's probably most notable for the fact that it's pretty anti-police. It's a mobster film that shows that mobsters and cops are basically the same, with each paying off the other to continue a cat-and-mouse game with no defining stakes. You've got to remember, we're pre Hayes Code here, meaning films could do or say pretty much whatever they pleased. But William Hayes, the creator of the Hayes Code, was a member of the Academy, and his moral guidelines would be another one of the Academy's creations in the following years. Let's talk Wings, the winner of Outstanding Picture, and what is commonly referred to today as our inaugural best film. Like Seventh Heaven and many other films tonight, Wings is a World War I film, following two soldiers and their romantic escapades throughout the duration of the World War. Honestly, it's pretty incredible. It's known today for its fantastic tracking shots and aerial photography and inventive camera work, and that's all super impressive. It's funny to compare Wings to basically any of the lesser works from this year and see how stiff and stilted and uninteresting they are by comparison. It also boasts a whole heap of firsts, 
first same-sex kiss on screen, one of the first mainstream films with nudity, most expensive film ever at that point. It's also one of those fabled productions that people can't help but romanticize. The shoot took nine months instead of the proposed one month. Clara Bow began an affair with Gary Cooper while engaged to Victor Fleming. Over 100 extras were seriously injured during battle scenes. The film had so many young men in it that the hotel where the crew was staying saw literally the entire female staff become pregnant by the shoot's conclusion. There's a lot. And it's our first best picture. There's just such a flair to it. It's long and silly and probably could have done with a bit of trimming, but it's one of the first epics of Hollywood and it still holds up. I've seen Wings a few times now, and maybe I'm just becoming more sentimental, but when Clara Bow sits next to Jack in his car that he calls the shooting star, and then a shooting star flashes overhead and they embrace, I don't know, I, I got swept up in the movie magic. Wings is just one of those movie movies with that indescribable feeling you can't quite pinpoint. But it works, even when it doesn't. And although it's my fourth favorite of these six nominees, it's a fantastic silent film and a worthy choice for our first winner. As we're going to see in many future ceremonies, the Academy rarely gets it right. But this is a rare win as far as I'm concerned. That's all, folks. So that's our top two categories, Done and Dusted. But there's actually a lot more worth discussing about the ceremony. I really love the idea of doing this deep, probably too deep dive into the entire ceremony, meaning I'm going to talk about every category, every film, every fun moment and awkward one. And if you're interested, we've got a few more awards tonight, including three that are now defunct. Best Engineering Effects, Best Title Writing, Best Director, Comedy. We've got some really odd categories here, and I'll run through them fairly quickly. Let's start with Best Engineering Effects, the only category that sort of exists today, though not really. I don't need to explain what this means, it's sort of been replaced with Best Visual Effects, but obviously before the advent of computers, any effects in a film had to be done practically. Take this famous example from modern times. The effect is practical, a feat of engineering and complex math to get the angles just right so as not to ruin the trick. We've got three nominees here. But they're the names of engineers and not films, interestingly. Ralph Maris was nominated, but for no specific film. He was just nominated. Not even nominated, really. I've been using that word because that's how we discuss the ceremony today. But Variety described Ralph Maris as an honorable mention. All of the losing players in films tonight are listed as honorable mentions, including entire studios. But to put this in more conventional terms, engineers Ralph Amaris and Nugent Slaughter were not the recipients of our Engineering Effects Prize. That honor would go to Roy Pomeroy for his work on Wings. This is absolutely deserved. Wings holds up, if for no better reason than for its effects. Everything is practical. The aerial photography is real. Cameras were mounted to the front and back of every plane, and every actor actually flew. I feel like this fact has kind of lost a bit of its charm as Tom Cruise and company did the same in Top Gun Maverick, but it should be discussed in the same breath, at least. And perhaps recklessly, the extras flew their planes and wings too. Every explosion in every battlefield was real. One oft-repeated anecdote tells of a board that Pomeroy rigged, with 18 buttons corresponding to 18 mounds. When director William Wellman pressed a button, the corresponding mound blew up. However, Wellman messed up during the shoot, pressing button 12 instead of 18, and blowing up several extras in the process. That's not a good thing, obviously, but I just felt like it was worth mentioning because films like Wings just wouldn't be made anymore. Visual effects have made sets safer, and they are undoubtedly the right call, but if we're discussing the history of the Oscars and its awards, the engineering of this epic film should not be forgotten. Best title writing is a little less exciting. Again, we've got a winner and two runner-ups, but our winner, Joseph Farnham, has no film attached to his credit. Neither does George Marion Jr. The only film ever mentioned in the only time this category was ever run is runner-up Gerald Duffy's work on The Private Life of Helen of Troy. Duffy was the first ever posthumous nominee, having passed one year earlier. The only thing worth mentioning here, though, is that I didn't watch The Private Life of Helen of Troy. My goal in breaking down this ceremony is to see every film nominated, no matter the award. 
Title writing may have only been a category at one ceremony, and Helen of Troy may have found this as its sole nomination, but I still wanted to watch it. Perhaps that's crazy of me, but it feels disingenuous to do anything else and claim this as a comprehensive look. Unfortunately, though, the inevitability of a century-old ceremony is that many, far too many, of these movies are lost to time. Of the 25 films nominated tonight, I was unable to watch seven. Four of these films, including Helen of Troy, do exist in some capacity, but they're locked up in MoMA or the Academy's archive. The remaining three are lost completely and permanently, a really frustrating barrier in our goal to watch it all. Luckily, as we move past the first ceremony and towards the 1930s and beyond, the number of times I'll have to say I couldn't find it will shrink and shrink. But for now, when it comes to Helen of Troy, the only film ever nominated for Best Title Writing, I've got to say that I couldn't find it. The category would be disbanded by the second ceremony, an archaic relic of the silent era. When dialogue eliminated the art of the title card, there was no need for the category honoring it. But, as mentioned earlier, title cards really had become an art by 1929, and it's a shame that we only had about two or three years of the art form at its peak. Our final defunct category was Best Director Comedy, a distinction that we still see at the Golden Globes, but which wasn't really necessary for the Academy Awards. The most interesting thing here is the circus of it all. The Circus is a film directed by, starring, and written by Charlie Chaplin. It's one of his lesser films, ultimately just a series of circus gags that are pretty much what you'd expect, but a bad Chaplin film is still better than most other films, and when the categories were first announced, Chaplin's name appeared three times, once for Best Director of Comedy, once for Best Actor, and once for Best Writing of an Original Story. However, for unknown reasons, Chaplin was pulled out of the running for these awards, and given an honorary award instead. If I had to guess a reason why, it's likely because Chaplin would have been the recipient of each award. It wasn't as though one would get a directing statue while another one writing. Chaplin did it all, and in the 1920s, that was a fairly impressive feat. As I mentioned, The Circus is, in my opinion, one of Chaplin's lesser works, but that's only because it lacks the emotion of something like City Lights or The Kid. The Circus still excels in the gag department. It pretty much tackles anything you think of when you think of The Circus. Chaplin stuck in the tiger cage. Check. Chaplin crossing the tightrope. Check. Chaplin getting lost in a hall of mirrors. Check. The gags are so fun because Chaplin always gives it his all. My two favorites are probably early on when Chaplin plays peekaboo with a baby to steal a bite of his food, and when Chaplin, stuck in the tiger cage, tries to send a dog to get help. He always gives it his all when he performs, throwing his body around like a noodle and expressing heavily with his eyes. In the story of film, Chaplin pretty much existed solely within the silent era. As we will see in future ceremonies, he stays silent while pretty much the entire industry transitioned to sound. Because of that, Chaplin's works will rarely be respected by the Academy, seen more as a reminder of a forgotten art form. But we do have one work, The Circus, to show how a Chaplin film would fare within the silent era. An honorary award sounds about right for The Circus. It is one of the best films of the night. Because of that honorary status, Best Director Comedy has a mere two nominees. The losing nominee is a work by Chaplin's fellow comedy star, Harold Lloyd. Speedy has long been my second favorite Lloyd film, behind only Safety Last. It stars Lloyd as his usual wily self. He plays Harold Speedy Swift, a man who can't seem to keep a job for more than a week. Speedy was directed by Ted Wilde, and his direction absolutely deserved the award tonight. Wilde directs the film with such a frantic, manic energy. The cuts are absurdly quick, and with Speedy's status as a borderline action film, Wilde directs car chases and streetcar brawls with an eye that leaves no confusion in the audience. In the interest of time, I'll only focus on the directing, as that is all that Speedy was up for, but I would check it out if you haven't seen it. It serves as a really fun time capsule of 1920s New York, with rare film appearances from Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, a look at Coney Island at its peak, and a plot that follows the city's final horse-drawn carriage. Bafflingly, our winning film in this lost category is Lewis Milestone's work on Two Arabian Nights. Remember earlier when I referred to terrible depictions of Asian cultures? This is the film I was referring to. 
two Arabian Nights follows, man, two prisoners of war who escape a German prison camp, accidentally board a ship to Arabia, and fall in love with the very white Arabian woman, Mirza, played by Mary Astor. However, Mirza is already engaged to be wed, and upon docking, her soon-to-be husband doesn't take kindly to these two Americans. It's a comedy of errors, but emphasis on the errors and not the comedy. I laughed once during this film's 90-minute runtime. At least, that's what I wrote in my Letterboxd review, but for the life of me, I can't remember when that would be. Our American leads are consistently and obviously in the wrong. I never rooted for them. One of the MacGuffins of the film is the veil covering Mary Astor's face. More than, you know, a look at a culture where women must remain modest, it becomes a gag where our American leads try to remove it to, quote, see what they're working with. It's more than eye rolly. It's gross. I was curious to see the reception for this lazy work, and the worst review I could find for it was Varieties, saying it was full of lots of hokum, but they followed it up with Packed with Fun. It seemed to be a hit with audiences too, and of course, it was produced by Howard Hughes. I've mentioned Hughes twice now, and I'll mention him a lot more when it comes to our third ceremony. But just know now, he's one of the biggest figures in Hollywood, and he's going to get an idea after watching Wings. An idea that you won't want to miss. Hughes held a lot of favor in Hollywood, and so Milestone's win here makes sense despite the fact that his direction is infinitely weaker than Wilde's work on Speedy. As explained, this first ceremony was only 15 minutes long. This video is already longer. But much of that ceremony had nothing to do with the awards and nominations. It was more of a banquet, with speeches and backbatting and requests from college students to incorporate film as a major in colleges. Douglas Fairbanks was the host and president of the Academy, and he and his wife, Mary Pickford, were really Hollywood's first power couple. They can and will be the subject of their own video, and we'll talk about Pickford a lot more during our retrospective on the second ceremony. But they kept the ceremony moving briskly along, stopping only occasionally for a speech by Cecil B. DeMille, or the biggest man of the night, Al Jolson. Al Jolson, the man who named himself the world's greatest performer, but who is perhaps best known today for one of cinema's most famous lines. I love to sing about Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Can we just talk for a second about how cool it is that the first lines ever spoken on film are, you ain't heard nothing yet? These lines changed film as we know it, and so it's an enchanting promise of centuries of entertainment to come. The story of the jazz singer is far too long and rich to explain here, and so I'll just abbreviate it by sharing how it comes into play tonight. The jazz singer follows Al Jolson as Jacob Rabinowitz, a man caught between following his father's footsteps and becoming a cantor at their local synagogue, or chasing his dreams of becoming a jazz singer. It's the century-old story of chasing your dream or what your parents desire, but the jazz singer adds a healthy amount of blackface in song and dance. Nowadays, the jazz singer is seen as racist at worst and kind of dry at best, but I lean more towards it being just dry. The blackface isn't good, obviously, but as scholar Corin Willis puts it, of the more than 70 examples of blackface in early sound film, The Jazz Singer is unique in that it is the only film where blackface is central to the narrative development and thematic expression. The film is very competently directed, and Al Jolson is incredibly good here. I'd argue he deserved an acting nod at the very least. But in the tapestry of film, The Jazz Singer's major contribution is that it popularized the use of sound in film. The Jazz Singer premiered on October 6, 1927, and after a mere two years, three in every four films featured sound. This was a monumental shift for the film industry, and we've never seen such a drastic change before or since. As mentioned at the top of this video, The Jazz Singer was barred from competing for Best Picture because it was thought to be unfair to have silent films try and live up to the potential of a sound film. Hey. It was him you just shook hands with over there. What? Taking one look at the creakiness of the jazz singer's audio and the stilted dialogue of pretty much the next three years of film, 
I can pretty confidently say that silent films were certainly outpacing the jazz singer, but the point stands. While the jazz singer revolutionized the industry, it received only an honorary award tonight, with Jolson jokingly complaining that the statue should have gone to him and not Jack Warner. He said, I noticed they gave the jazz singer a statuette, but they didn't give me one. I could use one. They look heavy, and I could use another paperweight. Still, for all of the hem hawing about whether the jazz singer was too advanced to compete against the rest, the film was present in one category. Best Writing Adaptation. Finally, a category we have today. We've got two writing categories for an adaptation and an original story. The Oscars will change these categories immensely over the following century. At one point, we'll see them split these two categories into three. But it is now as it is today. Three films nominated for an adapted work and three for an original screenplay, with The Jazz Singer up for adaptation. Let's start there then. The Jazz Singer was an adaptation of a play which was adapted from a short story. And I can't comment much on how it is as an adaptation as I haven't seen the play nor the story. But I can say that the jazz singer's screenplay is pretty weak with a lot of cliches and convenient plot beats. I'm a little surprised the jazz singer lost though, given all of the talk about how monumental it was. But lost it did. The other losing film here was Glorious Betsy. And wow, this is where I wonder what people would want from this series. As of right now, I love the idea of this being a full, deep, deep dive of the ceremony and the films that make it up, but in doing that, it means we're about to spend 60 seconds of our precious lives talking about Glorious Betsy. If you've made it this far, let me know if you want an all-encompassing look in future episodes, or if we can abridge the Glorious Betsies of the world, because, woof. This was a period piece, adapted from the life of Napoleon, and follows his lesser-known brother, Jerome. Conrad Nagel plays Jerome, and he is, I guess, our dashing hero. All I know is he was incredibly forward with his advances on women. In this scene, opposite Drew Barrymore's grandmother, Dolores Costello, he's supposed to be lovesick and embracing Costello, telling her not to leave, but I just know there was no intimacy coordinator on set here, because his hands are way too high. There's also this scene, following Betsy as she confides in her maid, and like, this is a dude in blackface. Like, I don't know who they think they're fooling. It's movies like these that I actually think are some of the most fun to cover. Because, I mean, who's talking about Glorious Betsy in 2024? I suppose, historically, this was a big hit. And did stand a shot at this award. It was directed by Alan Crosland, who also directed The Jazz Singer. But all I've got to say is that for all of The Jazz Singer's faults, we are probably two timelines away from Gloria Spetsy being our first talkie, and our first spoken words in movie history being, Get away, you imp of misfortune. My luck's bad enough. The winning script was Benjamin Glazer's for Seventh Heaven, which is easily the right choice. I've actually got issues with Seventh Heaven's story, too. If you remember, this is the Best Picture nominee about the Parisian sewer worker Chico who falls in love with the prostitute Diane, but its fine story is muddied by a lot of odd writing decisions. Like, Diane is very nearly rescued by her aunt and uncle at the beginning of the film, but they ask her to tell the truth about whether she is immoral or not, and she can't lie, so she says how she is immoral, and the aunt and uncle just leave, deciding not to take her home. This scene could be fine, but it's all hammed up so far in the dialogue, and it's more goofy than impactful. And then the ending of Seventh Heaven is really, really ridiculous, but I guess I won't spoil it here. So all in all, this writing award was very weak. But then we have the best writing for an original story, and it's night and day. Both scripts here are much better than the three we've just mentioned. The honorable mention was The Last Command, which we'll talk about more later. It's a pretty good film about a Russian czar who finds himself penniless and becomes the extra on a film set, where the director is someone he used to know while he was in power. It's kind of an out there plot, but the writing is super solid, and its best aspect is undoubtedly its lead performance, which we'll get to. The winning script here was another win. It's Ben Heck's Underworld, an absolutely fantastic film. I can sense your energy draining, and so we won't spend too long on Underworld, but it's another crime film, this time following a gangster named Bull Weed. Bull Weed's got a partner named Rolls Royce, and a sweetheart named Feathers, but he finds himself on the wrong end of the law and facing death. Rolls Royce is a weasel and secretly wants Feathers for himself, stranding Bull Weed in prison. But Bull Weed won't let bars stand between him and his revenge. It's so fun! This is pre-Haze Code, and so we get shootouts and dancing and alcohol and the death penalty. 
it's probably the peak of what people think of when they think of classic gangster films. A whole lot of wisecracking and no fluff to go with it. If you can't tell, I really, really enjoyed this. And it's a shame this was the only category it was up for. Today, most people remember it as the first American film of the great Josef von Sternberg. And so we're looking at a similar situation to what we see in Sunrise. It was at this point when Hollywood was really expanding and spreading their wings and plucking the best European directors and letting them run wild in the States. There's a reason that so many films love to romanticize the wild, wild west of 1920s movie making. There was something in the water and everyone was drinking it. Underworld isn't wooden or slow or lacking in any way. It's a mystery as to why this wasn't up for Best Picture. We're not at a time when the Academy Awards are hotly debated and snubs are well documented in newspapers of the era. As far as I could find, there wasn't a single outcry at any of the awards of the night. If I had to guess why Underworld didn't get the nomination, I'll call it the Howard Hughes effect, by which I mean Howard Hughes produced The Racket, the lesser gangster film up for the top prize and which more than likely kept Underworld from a shot. Hughes again is a really polarizing figure who is slowly but surely starting to gain some steam and he's only a few years away from one of the most wild displays of hubris ever put on screen. But for now, we're talking about Underworld and despite only a single nomination, it is completely worth your time. We've only got a few categories left, but there's still some heavy hitters to talk about, including Best Actor and Best Actress. First, let's talk art. Best Interior Design is our category here, an award that would eventually be renamed Best Art Direction, but it's straightforward. What do your sets look like? Interiors, exteriors. We're at the height of the studio system, and so most every exterior you see in these films wasn't shot on location, but rather a controlled set environment. It means we've got some beautiful sets up for the prize tonight. Our two losing nominees are Sunrise and Seventh Heaven. Both have brilliant sets. Sunrise in particular stands out as one of the few films actually shot on location in Lake Arrowhead, California. But Sunrise also has sets at a local fair and a quiet farmhouse. I want to make sure I'm giving Sunrise its dues, basically, because I don't exaggerate when I say that Sunrise is truly one of the greatest films ever made. We're going to be talking about it in three of the next five categories, and so I won't spend too long here, but Sunrise is one of the only films from this ceremony that feels truly timeless. We did a silent films episode a few months back, recommending silent films for people that had never seen them before, and Sunrise was one of, if not the, single highest recommendation. When going through these films, I love the crowd for how pertinent it felt for me personally, but Sunrise is probably the greatest work overall. Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, follows the man and the wife, two lowly farmers played brilliantly by George O'Brien and Janet Gaynor in the two best performances of 1927. The man meets a woman vacationing from the city and begins an affair. She wants him to murder the wife by drowning her in the lake. The man agrees at first, going so far as to attempt the crime before the wife's reaction of devastation causes him to rethink everything and remind himself of why he fell in love with his wife in the first place. It is a beautiful, haunting look at ideas of love versus lust, a quiet life versus a fast one, and greed in all of its ugliness. Every aspect of Sunrise works, every single one. There's not a missed beat, an unnecessary line, an unconvincing reaction. This is one of my 100 favorite films ever made, and it is my single highest recommendation if you haven't yet seen it. It's going to lose the Interior Design Award, the only award it will lose tonight. Seventh Heaven will lose too, which is an even bigger shame as I've mentioned the sets are probably Seventh Heaven's strongest aspect. But neither film could compare to the William Cameron Menzies of it all. I can't name too many production designers, but I can name Menzies, as he is arguably the most famous to ever do it. His most famous work is Gone with the Wind, but Menzies is probably unquestionably the greatest production designer of all time. He literally created the title of production designer and then hired himself as one of the first. That's pretty cool. He also wins for two films tonight, with one being another dreaded lost film in The Dove. The Menzies work I was able to watch was John Barrymore's Tempest. John Barrymore, a.k.a. Drew Barrymore's grandfather, a.k.a. Dolores Costello's husband, a.k.a. one of the ten or so best British actors of all time, at least according to pretty much every major news outlet. 
I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we've got another great film here. This was the major surprise for me of this whole breakdown. I was expecting so much melodrama, so many overlong productions with undeniable racism and sexism and every other ism. And yes, some of these films were bad, but there were so many more that were great despite incredibly low expectations. Tempest was a fun little drama about Barrymore fighting against corrupt Russian officials and breaking out of prison and falling in love and giving us action when we wanted action. Barrymore is almost a Tom Cruise type. His films are just displays of him and how cool he is. Like Cruz, you know what you're getting into with a John Barrymore project, and it's usually a good time. There's so much more to talk about with Barrymore. He's kind of considered one of the forefathers of silent film acting, and a huge inspiration to so many artists, including many we've already talked about tonight. But for now, we'll put a pin in it. This series is going to be a sliding door of names and faces. Very few people only made their mark on one year of Hollywood, and so consider this more of an introduction to Barrymore rather than a complete look. Menzies' work on Tempest was good, of course. I particularly liked Barrymore's jail cell set piece. Still, I don't think it was quite up to par with the pretty insane work done in Seventh Heaven or Sunrise, and my vote would have gone there, or even for The Crowd, which wasn't nominated despite some really great sets. There was certainly an anti-The Crowd sentiment tonight. If not an interior design nod, surely it deserved to be considered for Best Cinematography, but nope. We got four nominees here. Technically, it's actually more like two. We've got a nomination for George Barnes for three films, and it's pretty discouraging because I couldn't even watch two of them. The Devil Dancer is missing. The Magic Flame is missing. Their posters look cool, I guess. The one Barnes work I was actually able to watch was Sadie Thompson, a Gloria Swanson movie that I'll talk about a bit more later, as there are some aspects to it that I want to highlight. Speaking of Swanson's, Sadie Thompson was actually considered lost for decades until a print was found in Swanson's possession after her death. So I guess in theory, my lost film counter could shrink to zero one day, but I find it highly unlikely. For now, these are just frustrating obstacles to fully understanding this ceremony. Oh, and also, Sadie Thompson's cinematography is nothing noteworthy. The film takes place on a remote Polynesian island that I like to call the United Artists Backlot, and Barnes does very little to make this film look exotic. Luckily, Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, gets its roses with its frankly revolutionary camera work taking the win. The camera work here is stunning. Tracking shots, forced perspective, close-ups, double exposures, quick cuts, and long takes, pretty much every shot of Sunrise is intentional at worst and gorgeous at best. Sunrise is really our big winner of the night, and it's absolutely deserved. Again, watch this movie. I'll even do you a solid and link it below. It's just that good. But I know this video has been super long so far, so let's break it up with a little game. Who created the iconic Academy Award statue? I'll give you a second. If you guessed Cedric Gibbons, you'd be right. Gibbons may not be a name you're familiar with now, but you will be. He holds two Oscar records, most times nominated for Best Production Design, 39, and most times winning production design, 11. And every one of those 11 times, he won the award that he had created. Despite how iconic it is, the statue is a bit ambiguous in design. According to the Academy's website, it can be described as a stylized figure of a knight holding a crusader's sword, standing on a reel of film with five spokes signifying the five original branches of the Academy. But it's been described as hundreds of other things, too. According to Academy librarian Margaret Herrick, it looks like my Uncle Oscar. That's one theory of many as to why this bronze figurine became known as the Oscar. At this first ceremony, Gibbons wasn't in attendance, as he was working on another project. But the sculptor of the piece, George Stanley, gave a speech on his behalf. Between this speech and Al Jolson's and those by college students, this was a ceremony that was really flying by the seat of its pants. Herbert Brennan, King Vidor, Frank Borzage. These are the three men nominated for the first Best Director Prize. And really, there was an obvious winner. Brennan was up for Sorel and Son. That sad ding shows I can't much say whether Brennan's direction was any good, but one review of the time called the film splendid and naturally moist. So I'm pretty upset because I don't think I've ever seen something I'd describe as naturally moist. I'm assuming this wasn't a very close horse race, though. Frank Berzage wins for Seventh Heaven, the film about the Parisian sewer rat and the prostitute, and you get the idea. 
I keep reiterating Seventh Heaven's plot because I just don't think it holds a candle to some of the memorability of these other works. Berzage is our first best director in history. And even though I've got nothing against the guy, I would much rather have seen the award gone to Wellman or Sternberg or Murnau or Vidor. In a scene that would be parodied in every single A Star is Born film, William Wellman, director of Wings, reportedly dealt with his snub by getting drunk in his home and cursing the Academy. I guess he stands as the first star to take the ceremony seriously. Of the nominees, it should have been the crowd which is directed so strikingly well by King Vidor that it is genuinely baffling he lost the prize. But I'll chalk it up to the very same reason the crowd lost Best Artistic Picture. Louis B. Mayer didn't like the film that showed that the boss is the enemy. In most future episodes, I think I'll end with Best Actor and Best Actress. Oftentimes, they're the two awards most documented, most contested, most campaigned for. We're going to end this first ceremony by looking at both of them in their infancy. Best Actor is less interesting to me. We've got two nominees, and this is truly the David and Goliath of nominees. On the one hand, we've got Richard Barthelmus for The Noose and The Patent Leather Kid. The Patent Leather Kid was horrendous, absurd propaganda. Barthelmus was literally nothing special, and that might be giving him credit. His biggest moment in the entire film is when he, after being seriously crippled while fighting in World War I, stands up, despite being paraplegic, in order to salute the flag. That is how the patent leather kid ends. Seriously. Barthelmus might genuinely give one of the worst performances to ever be nominated for an Academy Award. You probably can't even contest that, because I challenge you to make it through the entirety of the Patent Leather Kid's 150 minute runtime without tearing your hair out. Then there's the Goliath, Emil Jannings for The Way of All Flesh, and Emil Jannings for The Last Command. I've already talked about that one. I called The Last Command a pretty good film when talking about its script, but its best attribute is easily Jannings. Jannings is a former Russian czar turned Hollywood film extra and he astounds in the role. He really displays the full breadth of emotions here, from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. This plot is really out there, and I don't love The Last Command like most people love it, but I do really enjoy Jannings chewing up the scenery and providing such a well-rounded performance. And come on, he's up against old Richard, whose best moment is this one. Janning's win was most impactful for the two pieces of trivia surrounding it. Firstly, Janning's was a German actor, residing in Germany at the time, and he couldn't attend the ceremony. Still, he wanted his statue, and as I mentioned winners were announced three months early, he had sent a telegram requesting the statue be shipped to him. It was, meaning Janning's was the first person to ever receive an Oscar. The other trivia note occurred about 15 years later. Jannings stayed in Germany throughout the 30s and 40s, and at the outbreak of the Second World War, he began to appear in Nazi propaganda works. When American forces entered Germany in 1945, Jannings ran into the streets with his Oscar statue, begging not to be shot and offering his statue as proof that he had ties to America. This was considered extremely cowardly, and both Germany and America rejected Jannings, effectively ending his career. Luckily, our final award to discuss, Best Actress, suffers from fewer controversies. Janet Gaynor, Gloria Swanson, Louise Drescher. These are our three nominees. As a quick note, and I do mean quick, I promise, where is Clara Bow? I think I said earlier that The Man and the Wife were the two strongest performances this year, but Clara Bow made Wings her own. Literally every time she wasn't on screen, I was just waiting for her to come back. Even if it isn't the best performance of the year, I think it's my favorite if only because it was so exciting and light in such a year of melodramas. It's a shame that Wings is seen as more of a technical achievement than an impressive feat of storytelling, because Bo certainly deserved a shot at the prize tonight. But on a more general note, while I didn't mention this explicitly, you may have noticed that both Barthelmus and Jannings were nominated for two films apiece. That's because in this first Academy Awards, actors were recognized for any notable roles they had held throughout the year. So Janet Gaynor was nominated for three roles, the most that any actor will ever be nominated for in a single night. 
She played the wife in Sunrise, she played Diane, the prostitute in Seventh Heaven, and she played a woman named Angela in a fairly bad film called Street Angel. Street Angel is, in some ways, a continuation of Seventh Heaven. Both star the same man, the same woman, were made by the same director, and follow eerily similar stories. Seventh Heaven was much better. Because she was nominated for three performances, I don't think it's a surprise to say that Gaynor would win this award. And at only 22 years old, she would be the youngest Best Actress until 1986. She really deserved the win though. I think the wife is her strongest role here, but she's the best part of Street Angel and adds a lot to Seventh Heaven. Gaynor has such a doe-eyed presence to her, which was really useful for melodramatic silent films. When an actor couldn't use their voice, their eyes did most of the talking. And Gaynor has an incredible range of facial expressions. Her first opponent, Louise Drescher, is not incredibly notable. She was nominated for A Ship Comes In, a dry look at immigrants to the United States and racism they often faced. I don't know. It was okay. There are talks of pipe bombs, which was fun to me in a morbid sort of way, but Drescher did not deserve a nomination, certainly not over Clara Bow. Of every performance nominated for an acting award tonight, Drescher's role is the smallest, with her only making up about a third of the film. When she was on screen, I wasn't blown away. And then there's Gloria Swanson, one of the most famous women in classic Hollywood history. Decades before she would be known as the washed up has-been. I have seen you before. I know your face. Get out or shall I call my servant? You're Norma Desmond. Used to be in silent pictures, used to be big. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. She was the woman who could do it all. She's nominated for Sadie Thompson, that film I mentioned earlier about the Polynesian island called the United Artists Backlot. Thompson is a prostitute, and she finds herself the subject of religious zealots attempting to lead her to a life of God. Swanson is good in this role, but I was most surprised by how much she had to do with this. She produced the film, which was extremely rare for women, and this role was a hit with audiences. It was Swanson's biggest silent film ever, and it is still considered one of her best performances today. I can't say that I loved it, as it was a bit preachy at times and its ending felt a little misguided, but Swanson does give a very strong performance, and it's fascinating to me that Swanson, the legacy actress, loses to Gaynor, the new up-and-comer. Without getting too far ahead of ourselves, one through line throughout the Academy's 100-year history is that typically Hollywood loves its comeback story. It's overdue roses. It's thanks for a lifetime of service. This wouldn't have been a lifetime of service for Swanson, but it did seem like the type of role the Academy would love to reward. Still, Swanson didn't lose any sleep over it. But that's what makes this ceremony so fascinating. There were no rules. There was no precedent or long season of campaigning. And as we see in literally the next ceremony, campaigning has always been a staple of award season. Because the Academy Awards are about to become much more powerful, they're going to hold more weight, and soon enough, we're going to see films made with the sole purpose of getting some Oscars. The first ceremony, though, ended as it began, with a speech by the man with the beach house, Louis B. Mayer. Mayer's documented words are, Life without service has very little in it. We owe a great debt to the industry that made it all possible. In other words, I know you're working long hours on dangerous sets, but what's life without a little blood, sweat, and tears? If anything, you owe the industry for giving you this life in the first place. And as the lights began to dim over this first ceremony, nobody knew just how true Mayer's words would prove to be. If there's anything to be said about Hollywood, it's that people will give everything to make it. And now, there's a statue to prove it. If you've made it through this entire video, Wow, that's genuinely shocking to me. This has been a labor of love over the last few months, and it's a series I want to continue. I'm already deep into production for episode 2, covering the 1929 Academy Awards, literally the next ones, but let me know what type of format you'd like these videos to take. In theory, this may be among the shortest video of the series, with only 25 films nominated across 12 categories. Some videos could even stretch to two or three times this length, and so I'm turning to you to help me understand what you want from these videos. Do you like the long, detailed retrospective? I'm also planning on making shorter, 10-minute, bite-sized Oscars videos if you're in the mood for something lighter. 
And if you did make it this far, I would love it if you gave me the equivalent of a YouTube Oscar and liked this video. Or subscribe, or share it, or comment on your own memories of seeing these films in the theaters when you were a young lad, for all of our centenarian viewers. We've got more videos on the Oscars and Alfred Hitchcock and Classic Hollywood coming real soon, so I hope you'll stick around. And until the next time, I'll see you at the movies.